Hello, my name is Catalyst and you are watching the world record for the first ever Dark Souls All Achievement speedrun completed under 2 hours. Achieving this took me more than 3 months of grinding and I'm extremely proud to present it to you now. For most of the run I will be explaining the thought process behind it, detailing the glitches, elaborating on the routing and providing other trivia with the goal of making the run more understandable and enjoyable. One more thing to note is that this is the remastered version of the game which has a separate set of leaderboards from the original. Please enjoy. Dark Souls has 41 achievements, or trophies, whatever you prefer, to be claimed. The goal of this speedrun is to obtain them all as fast as possible. Some of them are really trivial, like obtaining the Estus Flask or entering Anolondo. But others take effort, like collecting all pyromancies, sorceries or miracles. The most important of all, however, is the Knight's Honor achievement about collecting rare weapons. Most of this run's routing revolves around it and the others are almost done as a side product. Some of the weapons on the list have a random drop chance, meaning I will have to attempt to farm them by repeatedly killing the corresponding enemies. Farming is what determines a huge portion of the run's quality. I start as a thief, the class is the master key by default and choose the pendant as the starting gift. Yes, the pendant! So I can later trade it with Snugly for the Souvenir of Reprisal, one of the three necessary Covenant items for this run, otherwise it would have to be farmed in the Painted World. After triggering the boulder, I run down to open the shortcut door, as I will have to come back later to kill the hollowed Oscar and pick up his crest shield. Two-handing the bandit knife allows me to have more DPS on the Asylum Demon and while staying behind him I'm hoping to keep on getting his favorable swing attack. The save and quit, or quit out for short, is performed to skip the long door opening animation. In order to ensure fairness and consistency of timing between different machines and platforms, the in-game time is used to time the speedruns, meaning the loading screens do not count towards the final time. What you see on the split is directly connected to the in-game timer running within the game's memory, tied to the save file. Upon leaving the asylum and getting our second achievement, yay! The goal is to proceed with ringing the first bell of awakening and then talking to Oswald. First, however, I need to conduct some business with the undead merchant. Unfortunately, I'm kind of broke at the moment, so I will pick up the soul located behind the initial fog wall in Undeadburg and perform the first major glitch of the run, the quantity usage. Quantity usage abuses the ability to open two different menus at the same time through a different glitch called prom swap, but more on that one later. By overlapping two different prompts, it is possible to manipulate a previously stored quantity into one of those prompts. Here I will overlap the quantity prompt while using a consumable and the prompts to reset the brightness settings. Any loading screen sets the default quantity to zero, allowing for up to 99 to be selected. This allows me to use a single picked up soul 99 times and thus have enough resources to purchase everything from the undead merchant. The items of choice are throwing knives, fire bombs, Lloyd talismans for mimics, the bottomless box for a glitch later on, Residence key to free Griggs, the scimitar, a bow, a shield and two sets of arrows. As I said, I want to free Griggs on the way, so I will perform a lower undead burg skip by jumping on this railing and quitting out as the character touches it. As long as I stay on the railing for long enough, the game will store my position there. Unfortunately, I get a bit unlucky and the position is stored too close to the edge so I slide off after the first quit out. Then, the momentum generated by a left-handed L2 attack of the hilt is used to land on the lower wall and then I drop to Loverberg. Navigating around the docks can be tricky but the pattern is nice and before opening Griggs' doors I quit out again, this time to reset the dogs back to their default locations. After the quit out I do a small Grig skip, where the wrench to open the doors extends further than the wrench of the sorcerer's dialogue. You see, if a dialogue is active, no actions can normally be performed. 
So this saves a bit of time and also protects me from the dog because the door opening animation has invincibility frames. Another quit out is performed on these doors to reset the dogs back to Lowerberg, which would otherwise have a decent chance of tearing me to shreds. The quit out at least skips part of the door opening animation, so it loses a little bit less time than regularly. These bird quit outs are essential, as without them the number of extra resets I'd have to do would make the speedrun extremely tedious and not fun. Next, I pick up the important gold pine resin, as that will be the main source of damage on the next two bosses, with Taurus Demon being particularly weak to lightning. I also equip the scimitar during the chest opening animation. Quick jump around the barrel allows me to progress quickly and up we go. Throughout the run, I will attempt to do most of the necessary equipment menuing during animations such as fog gates, ladders or bonfire warps as to minimize time loss. Here I apply the resin in position that gives me a chance to have the animation cancelled by an arrow, which I was lucky to get. Taurus staggers on the 4th hit with the scimitar, so the strategy is to attack 3 times, regenerate stamina to full, unleash a combo of R1s and then finish him with an R2 attack. You notice that I equipped the bow and previously arrows as well. The 2 sets I had purchased are so that I can attempt to drop one set of them, making the game store that quantity, while also having the other set equipped and usable. Next I use the short bow to aggro the Hellkai Drake and make him drop on the bridge. Then I quickly apply the resin with good positioning to dodge shots from the hollow archer who survives Hellkite's initial onslaught, and then I cut the Drake's tail. Dragon tails are necessary for the Knight's Honor achievement. Those are Hellkites, Gapings, Priscillas, Seaths and the Stone Dragons. While pulling the lever the shield is now equipped in the right hand so it can be used to push enemies out of the way in the hollow room. Having the hilt in my left hand also allows me to block, which means I can get a roll out of a sprint instead of a jump. It is possible to rebind jump in the remaster, but that can compromise precision, so I prefer to play the standard way. The gate here is not closed because I outrun the hollow who scripted to close it. Before going to gargoyles, I activate the shortcut to use it a couple of times later. Gargoyles will stagger after 3 hits, so the strategy is similar as on Taurus. On this fog gate I also place my mouse cursor in a specific spot, which will play a big role shortly. I managed to get a good opener, which allows me to actually use a firebomb in place of a regular attack while my stamina is regenerating. This way I get a second stagger and can just finish off the gargoyle afterwards. I do a lot of menuing here on the ladder. Most of it is to reorganize my inventory for later things in the run. I then queue up dropping the stack of wooden arrows and because I have 999 of them, the game stores that value of 999 in the memory. Then, I yet again perform the quantity usage glitch, but this time I can manipulate the stored quantity of 999 into the prompts. I need these souls for upcoming NPC purchases. After ringing the bell and collecting another achievement, I drop to Oswald to purchase Homeward Bones to use for the run, his Miracle, two rings of sacrifice for two planned deaths, and then perform a prompt swap glitch. Prompt swap abuses the ability to use the mouse and controller simultaneously. Here at Oswald, I will attempt to purchase an item with a controller while clicking on the spell tab which switches the merchant's item category with the mouse at the same time. This will allow me to carry the purchase prompt from the Bloodbite ring into an empty tab of spells. Confirming this prompt purchases an invalid item, however, spells count as goods and goods also include consumables. The Bloodbite ring's ID is 109 and there is a consumable sharing this ID. The invalid item will therefore assume the properties of a consumable with the corresponding ID 109, which is the Eye of Death. 
This way, I can easily obtain the second necessary covenant item without having to pick it up later. Promsoft will be abused several more times throughout the run with various uses. For those keen to understand it further, I have a full video covering it and its origin story. It will be linked down below. The next goals are to pick up the Red Tearstone Ring, purchase initial sorceries from Griggs and then head to Analondo. The Red Tearstone Ring is a crucial item for the speedrun as it doubles or even triples the player's damage based on the damage calculations while they are under 20% health. This means that in many fights, getting hit even once will result in a death. Lotric was killed so that the Fireling Shrine bonfire remains usable. I also quantity used humanities on the elevator. I will be offering them later to the Fair Lady to open the Isolate shortcut, and also having up to 10 soft humanities increases the player's item discovery. By the end of Dragon, I pick up the Dragon Crest Shield for Knight's Honor, but it's also going to be my main shield of choice for most of the run. I've also picked up two extra souls, which I will quantity use in order to level up for the ONS fight. As I'm running through the valley, I want to address one thing you might have noticed. I constantly swap, or toggle, my weapons. I do this in order to speed up the acceleration animation, and it basically allows me to start spinning a little bit sooner. It's a tiny time save each time, but it adds up over the course of the run, and I assume it saves me at least 5 seconds. There's also something to do when just running around. From Griggs, I purchased Fall Control, Great Soul Arrow, Great Heavy Soul Arrow, both of his rings, and the Sorcerer's Catalyst. The Bellowing Dragon Crest Ring boosts sorcery damage by 20 to 25%, depending on the spell, while the Lingering one increases duration of buffs. After quantity using the two picked up souls, I equip the newly purchased gear and head over towards Undead Parish in order to perform the first major sequence break of the run, the Sands Gate Skip. But first, I quit out to reset the enemies chasing me. This skip abuses a specific state of the game called the Death Cam, which is usually activated when the player falls off of a platform and is going to die a horrible death. Generally, however, the triggers for activating death cam and reducing the player's health power to zero are separated and do not overlap. This is exactly what I will abuse. After baiting a holo to follow me, I will precisely position myself on the stairs and through parry and repost force my character partially through the wall, just enough to collide with the death cam trigger, but not with the kill box, which is situated slightly lower. While in this state, the game stops loading or deloading anything. The developers expect the player to die after all. However, in order to save computing power, assets to areas are loaded later than the areas themselves. At the moment of this death cam's activation, the start of Sense Fortress is loaded, while its closed gate is not, allowing me to enter this area without ringing both the bells of awakening. If you want further visual demonstration, I have a video covering this skip and it will be linked in the description. I also rest at the Undead Parish Bonfire to level Attunement, Strength to use the Dragon Crest Shield, Dexterity which up to 45 increases casting speed, and Intelligence to 75, as I need to keep some souls for Giant Blacksmith. I also attune to 3 sources purchased. To get rid of the Death Cam, a simple quit out is performed after passing the usually closed gate. If the quit out is always done in a similar place, the pendulum cycles here in the fortress will be consistent, since they reset after a loading screen. Navigating through it then shouldn't be a problem. There are several ways to free Logan, but I will literally use the power of my body to break the sealed wall. The stand-up animation of the character has destructive properties. This is to prevent the player from somehow getting stuck after loading their save file. The issue is that the ground leading up to the wall has unstable property, meaning it does not store the player's position, so I cannot just walk up to the wall and quit out. Instead, I need to jump over the unstable ground right into the wall. This is done by dropping on this cell from the bridge and then jumping into the wall at a relatively specific angle next to the snake. 
I briefly switched to mouse and keyboard for this skip, as it is easier to perform it on it. Furthermore, you might have noticed the instant jump off the cage. This is because as I land on it, I'm already holding sprint, and during the small landing stagger, the game basically charges up the sprint already, and when I hold the jump button, the game simply performs a jump as soon as possible. I also bound the confirmation button to my mouse wheel, allowing me to quickly scroll through long NPC dialogues. I use it on Logan here. I pick up the soul of hero, and finally free Logan. Progressing his questline is not only necessary to obtain more powerful sorceries, but also to obtain all the sorceries for the achievement. The squid out is done to reset the boulder in order to not have to wait for as long at the bottom of the staircase for it. I first head downstairs to pick up the covetous gold serpent ring, which will in combination with the 10 humanities max out my item discovery. Normally, several boulders need to stack up, and only then will the wall here break. But if I put my body between the boulder and the wall, I can break the wall immediately. While waiting, I also dropped an item I won't need anymore. I will be doing this throughout the run to keep my inventory clean, primarily for weapon upgrades and blacksmiths. I could even drop the armaments required for Knight's Honor as they just need to be in my inventory at some point, not all at once. The Mimic here is put to sleep, using a Lloyd's Talisman, and the Lightning Spear will be used to not just fully upgrade the Lightning Weapon, but upgrading it to plus 15 for another achievement, and also to ascend it via a boss soul at the very end. Then I quit out next to this elevator, and although elevators don't store the player's position because of their unstable property, here I am standing so close that the elevator picks me up anyways. The lever here is pulled, so we can progress Sigmar's questline, because as he moves to Farlink later on, he gives away a miracle. Now let's progress towards Iron Golem. Another soul is picked up because the build used is obviously quite resource heavy. There are two more separate level ups I will need to do. Fighting Aram Golem on top of Sand's Fortress has a special strategy. Dealing 400 damage beneath his knees will make him stagger. One Great Heavy Soul Arrow with the Bellowing Ring equipped will be enough for that. Another 200 damage makes him fall on his butt. A Great Soul Arrow will suffice. I will try to do it in a way to angle the Golem perpendicular enough to the side of the bridge to make him fall off. Then I roll into the fire on the ground and toggle my weapon to perform a toggle escape. Toggling a weapon takes priority over almost any other animation, including the stagger from being hit by most attacks. This way I can survive and simply make it to the ring taking me to Analondo. After entering the City of Gods, I proceed to take the first bonfire in order to have it accessible later, and then perform one of the several ways of avoiding fall damage in Dark Souls. This one is called Fall Control Quit Out. Fall Control is a sorcery which normally prevents non-lethal fall damage from occurring. By non-lethal, I mean fall damage which doesn't kill the player from full health. However, what it also does is delaying the lethal fall damage from being inflicted to the character. This can be abused, because the player's position is stored immediately upon landing, and before the delay passes and the damage occurs, I can simply perform a quit out. Upon loading back in, the game will spawn me at the bottom of the fall, but alive. This is obviously faster than simply taking the elevator. For the rafters I equip the Dragon Crest shield for more blocking stability, and the East-West shield goes into my right hand to once again be able to push enemies out of the way. The Painting Guardians can sometimes present quite a big problem, and this is the fastest way of dealing with them. 
I will also break the chandelier while purposefully taking damage in order to start setting up my health for red tear stone rings or RTSRs. Activation. Now instead of going around to enter the cathedral, I will execute the Silver Knight Archer skip. First, I enter the elevator and turn its lever. A quit out will follow to place me back on the last stable position, that is to the last location before entering the elevator. I then perform another glitch to avoid fall damage. The air rolls. Air rolls in the remaster are quite simple. As long as the player is between 25 and 29% of weight load, they will be allowed to continuously chain rolls even when midair. I explain air rolls with more detail in my video about blight down skip. With proper timing of the first roll, the last roll's invincibility frames can be exploited to avoid fall damage. Furthermore, the subsequent death cam works a little different than the one used for sense gate skip. This one is just a singular plane programmed to kill the player once they land on flat ground. However, fall control prevents the interaction from occurring as long as it's active. In order to keep the buff for long enough, I also equip the Lingering Dragon Crest Ring which boosts its duration from 30 to 45 seconds. With this death cam, I'm able to do the Silver Knight Archer skip and run past a shortcut door directly to the giant blacksmith. This is not only slightly faster than running around to enter the cathedral, but saves substantial amount of time when visiting the giant blacksmith is necessary. From him I get a max stack of large titanite shards, 16 green titanite shards, and giant's halberd for knight's honor. Coming up next is quite a difficult and random fight, Ornstein and Smo. The strategy in phase 1 is to kill Ornstein, because Super Smo is easy to stagger lock in phase 2. Depending on the opener, I will try to separate Ornstein from Smo and kill him as fast as possible. The issue is that he can jump around quite a lot when spells are cast, so let's hope that doesn't happen. Here I simply take extra fall damage to reach the RTSR range. Phase 1 went really well, and two great heavy soul arrows were enough to dispose of the bunny hopper. Smo here wasn't great, because him jumping back made me hit his hammer. Optimally, he would just keep shoveling into the pillar. More item dropping on this elevator and the quit out to skip the door animation. Then, rather killing Guinevere's illusion, I talk to her instead as I need to discover all the covenants for all achievements, but joining them is not necessary. Now after obtaining the Lord Vessel, the goal is to return to Fowling and upgrade our sorceries. But I will first warp to Undead Parish in order to talk to Zygmire and make him progress further. Warping to Fowling and then to Parish means that my last bonfire will be set in Fowling while keeping the number of warps the same as if I had warped there directly. Soul dupe is done here for levels and the spells I want to obtain. Uh. 
I purchased a Soul Spear and Homing Soul Mask from the Sorcery, while listening to his exit dialogue in order to progress his questline further. Once Firelink is reloaded, he will have left, and Griggs will be selling a second Soul Spear, which is very useful to have, as I will have 8 casts of it available, instead of only 4. I level more attunement to have space for these spells, endurance for better arrow setups and not mid-rolling with more equipment, and also 99 intelligence for maximum damage. From here, the goal is to get to Blighttown to ring the second bell of awakening and rest at the Daughter of Chaos Bonfire. Instead of taking the shortcut, however, I will take the regular route through the depths as there are other tasks to complete there. To gain access to the depths, I need to kill Capra Demon, and the fastest way to do that is to perform a neat little skip into his arena from up around Deadburg. In the remaster, there's this wonky collision with ladders which I can exploit to get on top of it. From there, I can roll onto a railing, use the hilt's L2 attack to get to the other side, which I initially mess up. Twice. And then fall off on top of that. This is undoubtedly the biggest time loss of this run caused by my mistake. From the other side, I roll down onto a pillar and get into Capra's room. The boss's AI trigger is located by the fog gate, however, and as I never go near it, his AI never loads and he just takes it like a champ. The dogs here can be a little bit annoying though, but the passive resistance from all the levels make them deal very little damage. The biggest issue is when they interrupt or even block my spells intended for the demon. Entering the depths, I want to free Laurentius for his pyromancies, pick up the large ember and cut Gaping's tail before killing him and entering Blighttown. Small little jump saves a little bit of time, and Kobe, with a firebomb, destroys the barrel Laurentius is stuck in. A pyromancer stuck inside a wooden barrel. Hmm. Oh, great game by the way, it just crashed out of nowhere. Fortunately, a game crash doesn't invalidate the run, and as the in-game time is tied to the save file, it rolls back along with the progress, although the extra stand-up animation does lose a little bit of time. You can already see the speedrunning rule of good runs having terrible beginnings in full effect. It meant I also had to throw the firebomb again, which is not the easiest thing to aim, but I didn't miss this time either. A cutout is needed here, otherwise I would get wrecked by the Butcher picking up the Ember. This rat is killed because it would otherwise block me when coming back from gaping. Gaping Dragon himself has two different openers and I want to get the slam as it exposes the beast's weak spot and allows me to set up the tailcat, which can otherwise be quite tricky. I start the fight with homing soul mass as the dragon approaches and of course get the less likely bad RNG forcing me to restart the fight. After the initial slam, I cast two soul spears, get out of the way of the incoming charge attack and shoot the dragon from the side. The last hit will both kill him and cut the tail, but not before making sure I don't get hit and interrupted by the casting channeler. His tailcat animation has to play out first before he dies, but employing a different strategy with way less consistency just to save 3 or 4 seconds is not worth it in a run of this length and randomness caused by the weapon farming later on. With gaping dead, we can now progress to Blighttown. Wow. 
Wow. I pick up the Yaito for Ascension and board back to Fowling, where Logan has now left and Laurentius has arrived. From Laurentius, I obtained the Pyromancer's Flame, which I upgrade in order to see Quelana in the swamp and also Iron Flesh and Flash Sweat, as these are not obtainable elsewhere. Flash Sweat will even find use later in the run. Wait, then I purchased the aforementioned second Soul Spear from Griggs, along with Oral Decoy for the Sorcery achievement. Yes, that will do it. Since I don't need Griggs anymore, I proceed to kill him for Hush and also the slumbering Dragon Crest Ring. To get to the bottom of Blighttown as quickly as possible, I will do a full control quit out followed by a slope roll. When sliding down a slope, the character technically never leaves the ground, allowing for a roll to be performed at the bottom of it. Similarly to an air roll, the invincibility frames of the roll allow me to avoid fall damage. From here, the next destination is Ash Lake, as there is a miracle there and a covenant. To get through the Great Hollow as fast as possible, fall control will be utilized, while also picking up a titanite chunk and blue titanite chunk. I won't need more than one of each and you will see why. The Great Hollow is the perfect place to obtain them, as they are directly on the way. What you saw there was yet another different method of avoiding fall damage, this time by plunging a slope surface. That puts the player into a very specific animation out of which rolling is possible, even mid-air. If the roll is timed correctly, once again the fall damage can be iframed, except when fall control is active, then the roll is not even necessary and the animation itself will suffice, just like in this case. I equipped the Slumbering Dragon Crest Ring or SDR here for the first time. It mutes my footsteps and will be useful for not aggroing enemies too early in some areas. The Ashleg Hydra has pretty decent tracking on its range attack, forcing me to roll here.
Here's the one miracle that needs to be picked up, and then I immediately quit out to put the Hydra back to the start of Ash Lake, otherwise I would have to deal with it. To a big surprise of the dragon, most likely. I rock up to him, got his tail with a well-aimed soul spear, discover his covenant, and immediately peace out. Before finally heading for the second bell, I also get power within. Not only do I need it for the pyromancy achievement, but it will be an extremely useful spell for the run. If you don't know, it increases all damage dealt by the player, at the cost of draining 1% of health every second. Even this disadvantage of the spell, however, will be leveraged to my benefit later on. In order to pick up the Remedy Sorcery, I now have to perform Blighttown Parkour, backwards. This starts with a full control quit out on this plank, followed by a precise jump to the chest with the spell. Now I'll do another fall control quit out to get to the bottom of Blighttown and then unequip my armor so that my rolls through the swamp have less recovery frames. Thanks to the upgraded Pyro Flame, I can see Quailana and buy all her pyromancies from her. I also ascend my flame to trade it with Snuggly for the Red Titanite's lab. It does not lose any time since I have to visit Snuggly anyways and is much faster than picking up the slab before Bed of Chaos. Then, a quick Great Soul Arrow and a Soul Mask kills her. This is done to obtain Fire Tempest which would otherwise be available only after finishing her questline. Now I'm almost done with my initial visit to Isolith. But I want to take the Daughter of Chaos Bonfire first. I attack the Yangi here to get infected with his eggs. This is so his discriminating friend sells me the pyromancies later on by the bonfire. Asshole. Quillag will hopefully get stunlocked with Soul Spears by attacking her human part. I got a jump opener, so I will also cast the Soul Mass after running under her. Unfortunately, my pro aim felt me with the first cast, so I need to finish her with one great heavy soul arrow. Afterwards, the second bell is rung, achievement is collected, Frampt is woken up in Farling so I can place the lore vessel, and I'll take the bonfire before doing so. I can also finally tune my second Soul Spear cast. 
Coming back to Isolith will be done after the upcoming two segments. I need to make sure to place the vessel by talking to Fram, since I will have to sell him things later on for a dupe glitch. Just jumping into the pit would have made him hostile, and that would be no bueno. Placing the vessel means the golden fog gates are now dissipated, and we can head over to the Duke's archives towards the first farming section. Here on the way, I need to pick up the Crystal Halberd for the Crystal Weapon achievement, and I'll actually end up using it in one fight, because it certainly packs a good amount of damage. Thus, these two giants must be killed first, otherwise they would mess me up, and then I kill the Mimic. I also equipped the Covetous Gold Serpent Ring for maximum drop rate for the Channel's Trident, which needs to be farmed. With the ring equipped, and more than 10 soft humanities, I'm now at maximum item discovery of 410, giving me roughly a 4% chance of dropping the Trident from each Channeler. That's not very high, so you can see how luck determines the fate of many attempts of this speedrun. On this elevator, I equip armor because there are going to be arrows soon, and also for extra protection in the next area. I also quantity use another soul because this is the perfect time to do it. Before killing the first channeler, I need to navigate around these crystal hollows, which can be quite tricky and require some thought out pathing. Channeler is dead and nothing. That's not surprising, but I can afford to farm several more as long as up to hours and not perfection is my goal. Now the objective is to kill Seath as soon as possible so I can talk to Logan and buy all of his spells. In order to skip the prison section for now, I will perform the Duke Upwarp. The way it works is that I first send the elevator up and quit out to spawn on the last stable ground. Then I do set up to store my position as close to the elevator as possible at a specific angle. After another quit out as the game loads in, it actually loads the elevator in its default position first, which is at the bottom, and then instantly moves it to the top. However, because my last store position is so close to the elevator, it actually takes me with it, allowing me to jump to the top of the elevator and out of bounds. This way I can perform a full control quit out and land not just past the first seat encounter, the prison section, but also on the floor where another channel guards the strong magic shield sorcery. Pretty cool, huh? No luck in getting a trident from this guy either. So now I store my position on the correct side of the room and turn the stairs because it will allow me to access that channeler again if needed. The position was stored so that I could simply quit out after the staircase was turned and spawn back there. However, there is another channeler here so I of course go for the kill and... I got the trident! It means that I have to turn the stairs again but getting the trident from the third channeler is really good. We call it the half cycle, since some time is lost to turning the stairs, but it didn't have to be repeatedly farmed from the balcony bonfire here. Now I simply air roll down here, instead of taking the ladder, as Yaito puts me in the correct weight low range, and I open the shortcut, whose opening animation is skipped with a quit out. This bonfire is taken because after killing Seath, more business needs to be conducted here alongside the aforementioned Logan. The power within is attuned, and I'll use it for the first time very shortly. As you see, I become a chick with my eggs hatching and can rock the egghead hairstyle. I know what I'm getting from the barber next time. 
This stage always occurs after a set period of time since getting infected. I put this mimic to sleep and get the falchion. The falchion will be used both as an enchanted weapon and as a magic weapon. It's going to play an important role in the Four Kings fight in New Game Plus as well. I'm making sure to also take specific fall damage, including the incoming drop to the bottom of crystal caves. I run off in such a way to always get blocked by the top crystal and safely land on this piece of collision, otherwise I would slide off and die. Before heading to Seath, I need to navigate this invisible platform to obtain the blue titanite slab. The platform is actually simpler than might seem at first, and with some practice, this is doable pretty consistently. Now with Seath, I need to cut his tail, which might be one of the hardest tails to sever besides maybe Calamites. However, I do have a specific strategy for it. First, I quit out here before the clams. Quitting out near most boss arenas messes with their AI in some way, Seath being no exception. It leads to him starting the fight by turning around, which exposes his tail to me. I also need to navigate around these clams in a specific way and force out attacks, otherwise they could enter the arena with me before the fog gate spawns and mess with the fight. I wait for Seath to turn around and then shoot the crystal. This makes him scream and stop moving. Immediately after I cast Power Within so that I have RTSR and the Pyro buff activated simultaneously, followed by a Soul Spear to his body while he's still staggered. The next shot goes to the tail, forcing him to scream and stand still. If this part goes well, the rest is a simple soul spear barrage while making sure to move closer with each cast to ensure he doesn't get out of range. This actually went great. I also have to heal up after the dragon's demise, otherwise power with him would kill me. You can see I lost a bunch of time on this split, but this is because of the extra turn of the staircase. I will save this time by not having to farm any channelers on the upcoming split. After C's death, Logan is now placed down here in the archives. I buy all of his sorceries and proceed to deal with him the same way I dealt with Griggs. It is important to shoot from behind, because his death animation would be much, much slower otherwise. Along with the white dragon breath necessary for the sorcery achievement, I also pick up the Tin Crystallization Catalyst, which increases the damage of sorceries thanks to his high magic adjust stat. The downside is that it halves the number of castings available when equipped, but I will use it tactically. Now, the last remaining location to clear here in the archives is the previously skipped prison, as it contains two different miracles dropping from the Pisaka Maidens located there. While heading to the area of the first encounter with Seath, I purposely take damage, you'll see why in a second. Instead of calling the elevator, I do the upwarp again, but this time with a different position so that I end up back inside of the elevator rather than outside of it. This Crystal Knight blocks the corridor and can roll spellcast, so I use the Soul Mass to get rid of him, and instead of waiting for his long death animation to end, simply quit out instead. Another creature blocking the way is this Twinkling Lizard, so I kill him too. Simple. Now here's the interesting part. Right before I open this chest containing an ember, I cast Power Within. As mentioned before, Power Within drains 1% of the player's maximum life per second. The reason I took the damage from arrows and why I want this debuff is because simply dying in this area transports you into the prison. That interaction has nothing to do with Seath himself. I find this strategy both clever and fascinating, but it makes sense that it would be programmed this way. I can also say that because I was not the one who found it. <laughs> Making sure the earlier purchase Ring of Sacrifice is equipped to not lose souls and humanities, I quantity used the Soul of Great Hero while waiting for Power Within to do its thing. Thanks to the two soul dupes I did here in the archives, I have enough souls for the final level up of my character.
Upon being trapped here in the cell, I whack the lizard with my catalyst and before he drops the key, I also light the bonfire. After opening the door, I immediately cast fall control because there's a pretty neat skip I will perform. The collision on the railing here allows me to stand on top of it. From there, I jump to the right, well actually twice because the first time I start sliding, and bounce in a way to land on this upper platform, directly above the place with the alarm. The run could actually straight up die here as well, as the miracles dropped by the two passive maidens despawned during a loading screen, and getting grabbed would kill me, so it's a checkmate, because not quitting out and quitting out both result in the miracles disappearance. Fortunately, that didn't happen, and thanks to some nice positioning allowing me to kill two Pisakas in one shot, I managed to get out safely. Normally, warping away from the cell bonfire is impossible, but it actually isn't a property of the bonfire, but rather the room itself. So simply standing on the outside and resting from there lets me warp away, right after leveling and attuning Logan's crystal sorceries. I get 50 vitality for upcoming strategies in Lost Isolith, and also 25 faith to be able to join the Sunlight Covenant at the end of the run. You notice I warped to Anolondo first, and then to Undead Parish, from where I immediately boned back. That was not a mistake. Loading Sun's Fortress was necessary in order for Zygmire to move forwards in his questline to Anolondo. The goal of my wizard here is to pick up the weapons stored in the cellar hidden behind the illusory wall, and more importantly to farm the Silver Knight weapons. I need to obtain their sword, spear and shield for the knight's honor achievement. The chances are 8% for the weapons and 4% for the shield, but unlike the trident there are more silver knights to be slain. It is no surprise that most runs usually cannot continue past the first two farming sections. Also, this first Silver Knight is an archer and they do not drop what I need. I make sure to first head upstairs to open the shortcut door and to also further progress Sigmar's questline. That is done by cleaning this room of Silver Knights and then talking to him. The Tiny Being's ring itself is irrelevant. Again, I'm doing this to receive the Emmet Force Miracle from him in Farlink. The shortcut is also necessary to access the Silver Knights here who wield swords, as there is only one of them downstairs. After killing the spear-wielding archer here, I head back downstairs and jump over the railing so I can open another shortcut. This one is used to farm the spears. Before resting at the bonfire here, I also pick up the Sunlight Medals, the last necessary Covenant item. I did not get any weapons from my initial cycle, which is not good. Let's hope Miyazaki's blessing will be on our side. The Occult Club is really neat, as it will serve for both the Occult Weapon achievement and also the Divine achievement once I revert it. This means I do not need to obtain the regular Divine Ember, only the large one, making routing much more convenient because Darkroot Garden, where the former is located, is going to be done in New Game Plus, while the Catacombs with the large Divine Ember are done in New Game. So, I get the spear here, meaning going upstairs is now necessary. I don't like farming upstairs because the Silver Knights there love to dodge soul spears.
Well, the only remaining drop is the shield now, but the lowest drop chance, so hopefully it does not take too long, right? Shields are dropped by both the sword and spear knights, so I can just stay downstairs again. And here's the shield! You can see I lost close to two and a half minutes here compared to optimal farming, but with the good trident drop, the run is very comfortably on sub 2 hour pace. From here, the next destination is continuing Lost Isolith to kill Bed of Chaos and also pick up the several embers located there. At first, I offer humanities to the fair lady, opening the big shortcut door before Fire Sage and also receiving the Chaos Stone Pyromancy. At least 30 humanities need to be offered, but since I have so many, notice I don't waste any time trying to offer the exact amount. I also talk to the bigot Engi, whose pyromancies I would not be able to purchase without the egg infection. He also conveniently provides us with another pile of flame. Since I will be offering the ascended one to Snugly, I need another one to keep using pyromancies. Killing Ceaseless Discharge is slow, so I'm not going to do it. However, that means I need to have a way of traversing the lava separating this area from the next. This is why I leveled 50 Vitality in the prison and why I'm attuning the Flash Sweat Paramancy from Laurentius. Flash Sweat reduces incoming fire damage, which is perfect for my need. To be able to get the achievement for plus 5 Chaos Weapon, the Chaos Flame Ember must be obtained. But since the lava is in the way, I have to abuse the level design and utilize Blind Spot at the edge of the area. First, I quit out to despawn the Taurus demons who chill in the lava. Then, I cast Flash Sweat and roll over to the first blind spot. There, I heal with a humanity and proceed further towards the Ember. Reminded that I also equip my second Ring of Sacrifice, meaning that I can beeline towards the Ember and not worry about a way out. In case you're wondering, damaging Ceaseless from down here is not possible. Unfortunate. With the second planned death out of the way, another skip over the lava must be performed. There's a good chance you've seen this one before, as it is quite popular. Ceaseless, or Lava Skip as it is called, once again abuses blind spots on the ground. Furthermore, Flash Sweat and the high vitality my character has make it quite easy to perform. Notice that the sequence of the skip starts with a slope roll, similar to the one I did when descending Blightdown, right before going into the Great Hollow. The biggest concern during this skip is to avoid the incoming Capra Demon, and also not taking too much damage during the skip, as that would force me to heal and thus lose at least 3 extra seconds.
In order to one-shot incoming Taurus demons, I switch back to the TCC, Thin Crystallization Catalyst. Before opening the shortcut, the large flame member must be picked up, so let's go to the left here. Taurus demons die very slowly, and would not only block me, but possibly even make my character fall off the cliff with their despawning corpse, so I'd rather simply quit out to avoid these animations. Navigating around these worms is easy when you know where they appear. Another quit out is done here at the chest to reset the triggered worms. From here, there are just two things left to do in Isolith. Pick up Chaos Fire Whip and kill Bed of Chaos. As this titanite demon is in the way, I politely ask him to move aside. Here on the slide, I reorganize some of my upgrade materials. This is very important for duping at Frampt, which will follow shortly. Incorrect order could mean a failed dupe and a sad reset. Bed of Chaos can be an extremely frustrating boss. Fortunately, I have a very convenient strategy at my disposal. I'll run directly into the center of the arena, and instead of going to each side to destroy the two orbs and disperse the barrier in the middle, I'll simply throw two precisely aimed firebombs to do it instead. This is a place where mouse and keyboard are once again beneficial, as aiming with the mouse is very quick and very precise, making this whole ordeal much more efficient than on the controller. Oh, 
You notice the egg hatched into its second stage. This is because I obtained 100,000 souls through killing enemies. It doesn't change anything besides giving the player a slightly vackier running animation and a new kick attack. Worry not, however, as I'll get rid of it shortly. Now, the goal is to go into the catacombs, where I'll also need to offer Eyes of Death to Nito, so this means I'll need to dupe them first. However, since I will be duping, I also want to dupe all the upgrade materials that I can now, so I'll first head over back to Undead Asylum to get the Titanite Slab and Red Titanite Slab from Stray Demon and Snuggly respectively. While I'm pretending to be an egg, although I literally just ripped myself off them, unnecessary items are dropped, again, to make sure the inventory is as clean as possible once I upgrade and ascend equipment. I also prepared the pyro hand for dropping. I'd say there's almost no time off during a Dark Souls speedrun, but this category is an exception, you'll see later. Let's head right to trading. Quitouts are done to reset the area and spawn the trades. Two things to trade means two quitouts. Now, instead of heading directly to Stray, I'll use the shortcut I opened right at the start of the run, if you remember. This is done to collect the Crest Shield from Holofight Oscar. The shield has fantastic magic damage mitigation, so I'm going to even use it later on. It took a while, but I got him eventually. I was standing too close, but Oscar likes to roll around sometimes, and standing close gives me a good chance to hit him in his recovery frames. I cast Soul Mask to get around the Hollows, who can be quite annoying in terms of blocking, and as you can see, it is indeed a reliable spell. I'll have to take more damage when dropping to Stray, so it's best to avoid the Torch Hollow specifically. That's no problem in this run, as they got stuck having a party in the Asylum doorway. For Stray, I use the Soul Mask again, and Soul Spears. Because of the mist cast on Oscar, I need to finish the fight with one great heavy soul arrow. There's a black knight on the way to the peculiar doll, so I switch back to the serpent ring for the extra item discovery. This dude carries the sword, which has a 45% chance of dropping. Any black knight also has a 15% chance of dropping his shield instead of the weapon. All of the respective black knight equipment needs to be collected for knight's honor, presenting the third farming requirement, but this one is a little bit different. Because there will be a decent number of BKs killed throughout the run, I'm hoping to just obtain all the 5 items without having to form them. I got the sword, nice, but that's also the most likely weapon to obtain as the run goes on, since the sword carrying knights present a plurality of all of them. Alright, time to dupe now. I'll start by putting all of the items to be duped in the bottomless box. Now, if I somehow offer a higher quantity of an item to Frampt than I have stored in the box, the game will underflow dupe it to its max stack instead of depleting it to zero. This is achieved by prom swapping from an adjacent item with a higher quantity than the stack I want to dupe. I first dupe my upgrade materials by using the consumables I have a lot of. Then I dupe the covenant items from the materials. It is precisely this reason why I make sure to order my items accordingly, otherwise the quantities would not line up and duping would not be possible and I would most likely simply offer the items to Frampt and lose them. Now I can finally head to the catacombs. The ability to dupe any item I have collected is the primary reason why all achievements can be obtained in just two playthroughs instead of the regular three. Three playthroughs were usually needed to ascend three different weapons from Soul of Sif, but I can simply dupe it after obtaining it for the first time. Nevertheless, two NG cycles are necessary for both endings, having both Ornsteins and Smo's souls, talking to both Ramp and Kath, and also having the Gwyn soul. I killed the Necromancer and quit out to skip the animation of pulling the lever. A 
Upon taking the bonfire, I need to withdraw the now duped covenant items from the box. As you briefly saw, I have 99 of all of them now. Through the catacombs, I'm going to first visit Nito and offer the eyes. Then I need to get the tranquil walk of peace and the great scythe, after which I visit Vamos. This is the only time I will be nearby, so it's the perfect opportunity, although funnily enough Remastered added the bonfire into his room so I could technically revisit him with ease if necessary. This is the singular part of the run where one can chill for a bit and snooze in the coffin. I usually use this opportunity to snack on my oatmeal, but it was too early at this point of the stream since this was literally the first attempt of the day. Another thing the remaster added is offering more items at once to Covenants. As you probably already noticed earlier with the Fair Lady, one of the few quality of life changes the remaster makes. Okay, now that I got the Gravelord Sword Dance, let's shoot towards Wamos and the item pickups. Here on the ladder, I reorganized the hilt and the falchion to the top, in order to optimize the menuing down on Vamos. The reason I need to visit him is to obtain fire and chaos weapons. You see, specific embers can only be given to specific blacksmiths, and Vamos specializes in these two. To get to Vamos quickly, I use a full control quit out. When talking to the blacksmith, I will first give him the two necessary embers. Then forget to purchase titanite charts and be confused about it. Once I finally realize it, I'll upgrade the Sword Hilt and the Enchanted Falchion, which gives me the Enchanted Weapon achievement. Then the Hilt is turned into Fire, upgraded to plus 5 and modified to plus 6, followed by upgrading all the way to plus 10. This gives me the Fire Weapon achievement. Then it's reverted and turned into Chaos. The Falchion is also reverted into Magic. I could upgrade the Chaos Hilt again, but it's going to be faster to do it later. My business here is done. Heading over to the Tomb of the Giants now. These bone wheels can be incredibly dangerous, even with such high health and resistances, so I'd rather quit out to reset them.
Now for the crowd favorite, Pinwheel. Hey, Soul Mask didn't disappoint for one. Nice. There's a pop-up for the Rite of Kindling which Pinwheel drops that would show up right about now and prevent me from entering the ladder. But simply opening a menu blocks that from happening and I can quite comically start climbing the ladder even through a wall. Some fancy parkour here. Navigating the area is not that difficult when you know where to go. I'll be taking this bonfire as there are three trips I need to take from here. And I'm also turning human as there is an NPC invasion incoming, which I will need for the gear Paladin and Leroy drops. First, I will head over to Nito's domain, but since Patches just looked at me wrong, I decided to kill him. Luckily, I also need the Crescent Axe he drops, but I'll pick it up later. A neat little platforming skip here to avoid the Fog Gate, and also get to the second Black Knight. There are only three Black Knights dropping the Halberd normally killed during the run, so getting this drop would be quite nice. But he drops the shield instead. I think that's even better in this situation, because remember, the shield drop is three times less likely than the weapon. Another small skip here with a boost jump. Tomb of the Giants overall is a pretty good place for platforming shenanigans, but you won't see much more in this category. While I wait for Leroy to invade, I prepare homing soul mass and swap rings. Since he also takes a while to die, I heal up back to full for the next fight. Leroy drops Grant and the Sanctus shield. A fun fact, the shield's design was actually a winner of a design a shield contest conducted in Japan for the game. The shield does indeed look quite nice, but I won't be using it unfortunately. Running around these enemies is pretty straightforward with consistent pathing. On the remaster, it is quite difficult to distinguish the small, fast projectile the pinwheels cast from the bigger, slower one before it flies out. But I figured out that pinwheels lanterns actually rotate clockwise or counterclockwise depending on the spell they are casting, so I used that instead to tell. I found that animation difference to be very subtle but very cool. Before heading to Nito's arena, I derail for a short bit to pick up the white titanite slab. Before the fight, power within is cast and I also fall damage cancel into the fight in order to avoid fall damage. This one is without fall control so I need to perform the mid-air roll. The fight itself is going to be pretty calm most of the time, unless Nito decides to start doing his scream attack repeatedly, separating himself from his minion who will attack me independently. Fortunately, that nightmare scenario doesn't happen and I manage to cast 3 spears before the skeletons fully engage. Nito's called first of the dead but his death animation lasts for an eternity, so I use that time to drop some clutter instead of just standing around. Time for the second trip in the tomb. After climbing the ladder, I pick up the axe from Patches and will now proceed to save Rhea and progress her quest. Her bodyguards became hollowed, so I need to slay them and then talk to the maiden. Much like Oscar, even these guys can sometimes dodge spells like crazy, but it didn't happen this time. Lucky for me, less lucky for you, as I'm sure there would be an angry reaction to it for you to enjoy. Last trip in the tomb is to pick up the large divine ember I will need to upgrade the occult club once I revert it back to divine. I make sure to equip the SDR because skeletons located closest to the ember will not hear me stand up after I quit out on the item pickup, thus giving me just enough time to homeward bone to safety. I will now return to Analondo to tie up some loose ends. The reason I don't visit it earlier is because of Gwendolyn. I needed to wait until I had duped the Covenant items. 
But first, let's head over to Painted World. On the ladder here, I swapped to the Crest Shield. This is because, as mentioned earlier, it does a very good job at mitigating magic damage, so it can be used to block Windolin's attacks in case of bad luck, and also for four kings if necessary. I can use an FC quit out to get from the rafters down directly to the painting. I take this bonfire because collecting the pyromancies located here leaves me in a sort of a dead spot, so it is simply quicker to homeward bone back. To avoid having to roll the hollow's attacks, I toggle escape them, but that will turn out to be a bad decision. First, I do a very simple jump over the fence here, allowing me to get to the town square early. However, I do lose a little bit of time to a phenomenon called the stored roll, where the roll cancelling the landed animation doesn't come out. This can happen due to several reasons, but I believe it was uneven ground at fault here, where the game thinks I landed on a slope and forces me to quote-unquote slide to the bottom of it before allowing me any further inputs. Anyways, I'll collect a sit search and head over underground through the well. Out of nowhere I get hit by a spear from the phalanx, and my first instinct is to take the ladder to not risk dying from fall damage. Looking back, it was quite ridiculous to think that could have happened, but while in the moment of a well-paced speedrun, especially one this long, you preferred not to risk it for potential seconds. That decision was doubly silly because I decided to heal here anyways, as there was a slight chance the bone wheel behind me could catch up and roll me to death, so I should have simply healed at the top of the ladder. Whatever, it's not a big deal in the grand scheme of things, but it serves as a good showcase of how very random and unlikely things can occur during the course of a Dark Souls run, like that phalanx spear. Now I perform a jump called Annex Key Skip, allowing me to get to the point of Painted World where the Dark Ember is, but because we already have the Occult Club, I don't need to waste time picking it up. I still need to get there because of other items, however. The skip itself is similar to Lower Berg Skip from the beginning of the run, where I briefly touch a platform with a jump, and then quit out, abusing the game storing my position on top of it in time. From here, I get the Velka's Rapier, and proceed towards Wall of Silence. After killing this bloated hollow, I quit out immediately. This is not just to skip waiting for his death animation, but also to despawn the already active crows. Now towards Priscilla, utilizing invisible collision around the bridge. The Painted World was actually a prototype level from Software Made, and Miyazaki liked it so much he wanted it in the game. Its snowy nature, however, made it stand out from the rest of the environment, so they decided to contain it within a painting. And honestly, I agree, I think the Painted World is quite nice and deserved its place within the game. Although some parts of it definitely needed some extra polishing. On Priscilla, I'll start the fight by carefully aiming a soul spear in order to cut her fluffy tail for Knight's Honor, then I lock onto her to potentially see where she teleports as she goes invisible. Luckily, she doesn't teleport outside of my field of view, so I can simply attack her immediately. This is it for the painting. Now I have to get poor Tarkus' set down here, and also the great magic weapon from the Chandelier which I dropped almost an hour ago.
The last thing left in Arnolondo is Gwendolyn. Nice backwards block of the dagger. This is actually quite a common occurrence in the remaster. No idea why exactly, but it sometimes happened on the original too. While turning the lever, I place Quelax Soul to the top of my inventory for easier duping following shortly. I also need to run down the stairs here in a specific way because the collision of the spinning spiral staircase does not match its model exactly and I would be sent airborne. The same way I broke the wall trapping Logan in Sense, it is also possible to break the illusory wall leading to the Dark Sun's arena. The small tombstone I jump off of essentially serves in the same fashion as the cage I had to jump off for Logan. This is great because I don't need to pick up the Dark Moon Sands ring, although I did run by it when in the catacombs. After offering the souvenirs originally obtained thanks to the pendant starting gift, I enter the fight and hope for favorable attacks in order to close distance on the boss. In order to one cycle him, a crystal soul spear and crystal soul mass are required. With the big blue orb or the arrows, I can approach safely, but with the homing attack, I will be blocking through it as dodging it is very inconsistent. This is what I equipped the crest shield for. Then I hide behind a pillar on the right side because going left would pop two orbs of the soul mass and result in insufficient damage. Luckily, I immediately got the arrows as a follow-up and could go for the kill. Next is looting the chest with sunlight blade and heading back to Farling to finish up questlines as I will be leaving new game soon. I make sure to also put Gwendolyn's soul to the top of my inventory alongside the soul of Quelag. I put both those souls and some newly acquired upgrade materials in the bottomless box and head over to Undead Parish to talk to Rhea. On the elevator, I do some highly important menuing. I'm making sure that the correct consumables with higher quantities line up with the correct upgrade materials in the adjacent tab. I've lost a runner or a couple to incorrect duping here. Losing this one to it would be very shameful. Then I clean my inventory again and prepare for air rolls. At Rhea, I discovered the Covenant and buy up all of her items before returning to Farlink again. Now I finally received a miracle from Zygmire and quickly head towards Rickard. Rickard is the only blacksmith who can work with the Magic Ember. I already have a plus 5 magic weapon from reverting the Enchanted Falchion at Vamos earlier, but I need Rickard to modify it to plus 6. I need to go through Rickard's dialogue once, in order for the option to offer my Ember to show. As soon as the weapon is modified, I return to Farling for a second round of duping. If you didn't catch it the first time, I'm variable underflowing the items I had placed in the bottomless box by offering more than are stored there. This is achieved through our favorite glitch of the run, the Prompt Swap. The 
last thing needed to be done in New Game is visiting Andre to use the large and large divine embers. Before warping there, I also turn homeward and fireball for a wrong warp glitch coming up. I have obviously not collected the soul shard from four kings, so I cannot simply enter the kill normally. Before upgrading, I buy all the different weapons Andre has to offer to use them for boss weapon ascensions later on. Then you see me rocking back and forth to the rhythm in the webcam, as I'm furiously trying to upgrade all the equipment as fast as possible. I dislike mashing on controller and my hands tend to get tired quickly doing it, so I really have to try. Here I finish up the chaos weapon achievement thanks to the hilt, as well as magic weapon. Occult weapon thanks to the Occult Club from Analondo. Lightning weapon due to Lightning Spear from Sense Fortress and Crystal weapon from the Crystal Halberd. I then revert the Chaos Hilt back to normal for Ascension, turn Occult Club plus 5 to Divine plus 5, and also revert Lightning Spear into Spear plus 10. The Divine Club is modified to plus 6, along with all the other plus 5 weapons, and I also make a raw broadsword for the raw weapon achievement. As I have said, at this point of time, I haven't killed the 4 kings, and thus cannot open the closed kiln of the first flame. That's why I will perform a wrong warp to access it anyway. Managing to change the location of the last bonfire right before a warp is performed. This warp can be corrupted, and the game will lose track of the player's position, putting them to the so-called default position, which acts as a failsafe instead. This position is arbitrarily selected by the developers, but it so happens that for the area of Firelink Alta, it is at the bottom of the stairs leading to the kiln. In order to change my last bonfire while warping, I'll use a separate frame perfect glitch called Spell Swap. Spell Swap allows me to cast Homeward, a spell which warps me to my last bonfire with the animation of Fireball. This animation can then be cancelled by falling off a ledge after the warp has already been triggered, and before it executes, the brief period of freedom is used to rest at the parish bonfire without the warp being interrupted, resulting in a wrong warp. Incorrectly timed inputs, improper positioning, or resting either too early or too late will all result in failure of the glitch. I understand this glitch is quite complex, so if you'd like a more detailed explanation, I've got you covered with a dedicated video of how exactly the homeward wrong warp works and how it was discovered. The Greatsword, the Great Axe, and the Halberd are the remaining Black Knight weapons. The guys here in the kiln are a little bit special in that once killed, their loot actually needs to be picked up from the ground instead of going straight into the player's inventory. Alright, two out of two so far, one more left. And no Halberd. That's okay, we still have a 45% chance in New Game Plus, so it should be fine. As I'm entering Gwyn's arena, I equip the upgraded Crystal Halberd and cast Homing Soul Mass. Now, depending on how many individual orbs hit, I need to switch between the Crystal and regular versions of Soul Spear in order to not deal too much or too little damage. Once Gwyn's low enough, I swap to the Halberd and finish him with a Ripos. You might be wondering why I just didn't finish the fight with spells. Well, whenever an enemy is killed through Ripos, they die instantly. That means Gwyn's long and dramatic death animation is completely skipped. Furthermore, I combine the ripost with a well-timed quit out, which puts me to the last stable ground just outside of the arena where very conveniently, the Dark Lord ending trigger is already active. Ooh, alright, that's one playthrough done. New Game Plus though, is scary. Like really scary.
Not only do enemies deal a lot more damage now, but there are several sections which are just asking for things to go wrong. One of the big reasons I also swap between the two soul spear types is because I want to keep at least one crystal cast in order to kill a Salem demon in two hits. Obviously, no items need to be collected here, so I head straight to Oscar. Similarly to how I broke Logan's or Gwendolyn's walls, I also break the wall here without triggering the boulder. However, there is no unstable ground here, so just positioning myself next to it is enough. After receiving the keys from Oscar, our dark sign immediately and return to the bonfire near the asylum door. The game gave me this bonfire because I ran through the shutting cage door before asylum demon was fully dead, otherwise I would have returned to the cell. Of course, this strategy couldn't have been utilized in New Game because I wanted to open the shortcut when returning back. Okay, now that I've left the Asylum, the goal is to finish up what I haven't done in New Game. So that is obtaining Ornstein's soul, and then visiting the areas of Darkroot Garden and New London Ruins. This routing is basically because of Kath. Without extreme shenanigans, it is impossible to talk to both Framt and Kath in one playthrough, and I still need the latter serpent because of joining his covenant and receiving the Dark Hand. However, getting Kath to spawn means having to kill the four kings, and killing four kings in turn requires collecting the covenant of Artorias from Sith, hence why all of this is done in New Game Plus rather than New Game. One downside of this strategy is never having the ability to use the hidden body sorcery, but as you've seen through the run, different tactics for running through areas like Duke's archives were developed, and hidden body would be a mere boost of comfort rather than a substantial time save. Instead of running around Upperberg, I simply roll down this shortcut to the blue tearstone ring and run around the Black Knight as he's another sword dude. A bow will be used to aggro Hellcat again, so I equip it here. Taurus Demon should pose no threat, so the biggest concern is dodging the arrows flying in from behind. I quit out here with such a timing that the hollows around me get destroyed by Hellcat's fire, but I don't. The Sunlight Alta Bonfire is taken to have the Sunlight Covenant accessible later on. I still only carry one Soul of Gwyn and thus cannot afford to offer it just yet, since it must also be used to craft a Great Lord Greatsword. Speaking of Greatswords, if I was missing the Black Knight one, I could have run to the top of the tower here and tried to drop it from the Black Knight station there, but it's obviously not needed this run. Alright, now I will head over to Undead Parish and perform the Sense Gate skip again.
Funnily enough, there's a slight chance when performing the Sense Gatescape repost on the left side like I did here that the Hollow might catch up to me and be too close before I can rest at the Undead Parish bonfire. However, left side is also slightly faster than reposting on the right. In the early game, I don't mind very occasionally losing an attempt to it, but late game would obviously be a blow, so how come I still repost on the left? Well, there's this neat feature where the bonfires which you lit in new game are kept lit in new game plus, meaning I can rest at the bonfire immediately without having to light it first. As such, the holo can never catch up on time and therefore it is safe to collect the incredible 1.3 second time save from this method of SGS. A similar quit out to the one first time round is done here to reset the incoming boulder, and then I also intentionally take counter hit damage from the arrow trap. This is so that I can have both the RTSR and power within active on Iron Golem at the same time, and save a soul spear cast. Instead of making the golem fall, it is faster to just shoot him from the middle of the roof and finish the fight directly next to the ring taking me to Analondo. Right after destroying the golem, I use the Divine Blessing I purchased from Rhea a while back. It comes in very handy. Because Power Within is a body buff and is still active here, I can't apply Fall Control, so I quit out to be able to do that. Running through the rafters is going to be similar, but I won't actually perform the Silver Knight Archer skip this time around. While it would be slightly quicker than taking the path around the cathedral, I want to rest at the indoors bonfire in order to regain my spell castings, otherwise I would not have enough for the ominous boss fight.
Navigating around these Batwing demons, I'm making sure to listen to their potential lightning spears being thrown in order to avoid them. But there were none. Depending on what this archer does, it might be faster to let him fall on his own. Other times, as in this case, I will simply avoid the arrows and soul spear his face. Now that I have my casts back, let's head over to ONS. The fight can be very scary on New Game Plus. I mean, it is already scary in New Game, but it is so early in the run that it's not too intimidating. Of course, with a run pace like this, all the way here in the late game, the nerves can also play a big role. The difficulty of the fight stems from having to kill Smo first and Onstein second. Super Onstein cannot be staggered and manipulated like Super Smo was, and he can be pretty elusive too, with the spells missing awkwardly. Meanwhile, during Phase 1, the opener will decide how I try to play the fight. The goal is to simply kill Smo as soon as possible without letting Onstein get too close. I get the walking opener which is not preferred to the dash, but let's hope for the best. I go to the right and let Onstein attack while running past him closer to Smo, but I actually ended up getting blocked. After creating some distance, I cast homing soul mass, wait for Smo to shovel again to not hit his hammer, and then go for the kill. One spear and soul mass hit make him stagger. There was also a pillar between me and Ornstein, keeping me relatively safe, so I went for the second spear cast immediately. Phase 1 done, and to my fortune, Super Ornstein decided to take a break and be very passive. Nice! Might have noticed I didn't just spam the soul spear cast, because you can never be sure when Ornstein decides to attack. There's no point going full yellow at this stage of the run. This time round, the lady with big charisma is shot with an arrow, as there is no need to talk to her again. Now, with the Lord Vessel acquired, I'm heading directly to Dark Root Garden. I purchased the Crest of Artorias here to access the forest without having to run around. The bonfire hidden behind this illusory wall is unwarpable. You see, not every bonfire in Dark Souls can be warped to with the Lord Vessel, forcing out some interesting routing strategies. In this case, I won't be leaving Dark Root until everything here is done, otherwise I would have to run from Parish again. Now I'll move towards the Moonlight Butterfly, whose soul I need for the horn and shield it can create. Yes, that's two weapons, meaning I'll be duping that soul as well. However, before I get to Butterfly, I will be killing the Stone Guardians for the final farming requirement. Besides the Black Knight Halberd I'm missing. I must drop the Stone Greatsword and the Stone Great Shield from these dudes, and unfortunately, the chance for a drop is 8%. A bit better than some of the drops earlier, but obviously not great this late into the run. The good news is that there are 5 of these Guardians alive for each cycle. The bad news is that they are pretty far from the bonfire. I also need to deal with these trees, or demonic foliage, as their official name hilariously states. The piercing property of Soul Spears is taken full advantage of here.
No drops on the first cycle. Unfortunate. But remember that the current pace is 1 hour and 52 minutes, so I can spare several minutes here if I'm lucky and still be on route to sub 2 hours. The butterfly fight itself is pretty simple. I equip the TCC and cast power within. Then I need to make sure to not shoot my spells too early because while the boss is entering the fight, it has full invincibility. Now let's run back again for another round of Stone Guardian. Hey, got the sword, but the shield is still required. And of course, I drop another sword. Thanks, Miyazaki. Way to rub it in, buddy. Alright, another round. I also need to mention that obtaining the sword is possible by progressing Shiva into Blight Town and purchasing it from him there. Maybe it would be worth it if you could buy the shield as well, but that is not the case and as New Game Plus never goes anywhere near Blight Town, using Shiva to get the sword would lose too much time. The old achievement speedrun is already the most luck based run in all of Dark Souls, so what's one extra job, am I right? Got the shield as well, and still comfortably on sub 2 pace. I need to free Princess Dusk now, who has several more sorceries for me to obtain. In order to do that, the Darkroot Garden Hydra needs to be slain, followed by reloading the area and locating a golden golem at the very edge of the lake. Killing him frees Dusk, but that's not over yet, as I need to wait back through the lake all the way to the side where Dusk can be summoned. It is not a regular summon like most other NPCs, so being in a human form is not necessary. In order to reach RTSR range, I equip the Havel Shield midair. Its extreme weight ensures that I take enough fall damage, as the amount dealt to the player slightly scales with the equipped weight load. No shield would mean no RTSR setup. Then I cast Fall Control and enter the fight with a fall damage cancel. Even with the overwhelming damage my Soul Spears deal at this point, New Game Plus Hydra still requires me to hit 4 individual shots. Because of my limited castings, I really want to make sure to hit each of them. The first is easy. The second one needs to be timed not too early and not too late, while also aiming to the correct spot. The third is quite similar to the second, except I'm also making sure to be moving towards my next destination in between. Same thing for the fourth shot, but I had to also make sure to roll Hydra's attacks here. That one as well as it could. I reload the area here as mentioned, and we'll see what the Golden Golem does. He's really beefy in New Game Plus, so I want to make sure my spells won't whiff, therefore I wait to see what he's doing first. I got a good attack, and after he lands, I go for the kill immediately, as a Soul Mass Soul Spear combo staggers him. Then it's just one more spear. I confirm to Dusk that I'm going to help her, and start rolling back to the edge of the lake. Navigating around the lake is really annoying, as the edge isn't very consistent at allowing you to run or forcing you to walk. While rolling here, I equip the SDR, which will make one of the two crystal golems situated near Dusk's summon location not hear me. Speaking of the location, there are actually four different spawns all located near each other, but each losing different amounts of time. This is a decent spawn that I got, but also means that the other golem will see me. I make sure to maintain distance so he doesn't start dashing towards me too soon. I do not really have any powerful casts to deal with him left, so I'm hoping I can get away before he arrives. 
If really unlucky, he could even kill Dusk and dust the run. He was kind this time, however, and I was comfortably able to purchase all of Dusk's sorceries. There's just one more thing left to do in the garden, and that is killing the good boy Sif. Well, actually, I also need to discover Alvina's co covenant first, then it's straight to Sif. While opening the gate, I equipped the magic falchion, because I want to use it for four kings coming up soon. I also cast power within, and then a soul mass. I get perfect RNG here, as my first soul spear connects as a counter hit, inflicting extra damage. This damage bonus is just enough to save me an extra soul spear cast, so I went for the kill immediately afterwards. Really good fight. Now it's time to wrap up the last few remaining achievements. This makes it sound simple, but trust me, basically everything left in the run is scary and could result in a reset. What is the ghost house in New London ruins? Four kings? Or incorrect duping or upgrading? Anything can happen. That being said, let's head over to the first mentioned. There is no need to unseal New Londo, as I'll be performing a skip to enter the abyss from out of bounds anyways, but the Hecke Ingward sells the last remaining sorcery which I'm missing. Here you see me do a slight movement to the left towards the wall. It forces the ghost ahead who would normally block the player to move out of the way. Because the pace is good, I go for a slightly safer strategy running around the ghost house first in order to pull the ghost away as far from the ladder leading up to Ingward as possible. That does not guarantee success however, and I can still get destroyed while climbing up anyways. It's happened to me multiple times before. Well, this time I didn't even get touched on the ladder, so that's great. While I was climbing it, I also positioned the souls of Sif and Butterfly near the top of my inventory for, you guessed it, some duping action. There's a plot twist however as I need to dupe them differently. Before heading down the ladder, I make sure to quit out so the ghosts are reset to their default positions. Running back from here is way less scary than climbing up, so it should be fine. Instead of going straight to four kings, I still need to pick up the very large ember here for the plus 15 weapon achievement, so I head over towards the building I came from.
I perform a simple FC quit out here to get to the lower floor, which is flooded at the moment. But with more than 100 minutes of the run behind us, little water can't stop us now. If you remember the Silver Knight Archer skip from Ana Londo, there's a similar death cam placed here, so I cast full control again to not get killed, and when getting above the trigger at the upper floor, I quit out to get rid of the state. After looting the chest, it's another FC quit out to get to the bottom and head over to Four Kings. I will be using a special strategy for this fight that if executed properly allows me to finish it with just two kings instead of all four. In Dark Souls, attacking dead enemies still deals damage to them, however since their health is already at zero, it achieves nothing. This is different during this fight because each individual king has his own health bar, while the boss health bar at the bottom of the screen is actually a cumulative health bar for all of them. This means that as a king is dying, I can still attack him, deal damage and lower the health of the shared health bar. Therefore I do a setup to damage the first individual king as much as possible without killing him and then prepare an onslaught of spells to deal as much extra damage as I can. Then I attempt the same thing on the second king and if no memes occur I will deal enough extra damage by then to make up for two individual kings, meaning I finish the fight in just two cycles instead of four. I begin the fight by casting power within, then I cast the soul mass and switch to the falchion. The soul mass and four two-handed falchion R1 attacks put the individual king's health as low as possible. Because the king opened with his homing magic attack, the crest shield comes into play as I use it to block the projectile. Then I prepare another soul mass, making sure it doesn't hit in advance and thanks to 45 dexterity can connect with three soul spears before the king's hitbox disappears. The item I had dropped at the beginning of the fight serves as an indicator of where the second king spawns, because not only the time, but also the location is consistent. I've dealt enough extra damage to where a simpler, quicker setup can be used on the second king, consisting of one soul mass and then a barrage of soul spears. The hope is that he doesn't move out of the way, making me miss and forcing a backup. Fortunately, the RNG was good when it mattered and the kill went amazing. I make sure to take the Abyss Bonfire so I can return here after being transported to the altar and also at the end of the run, as the Falling Altar Bonfire, similar to the Dark Root Garden, cannot be warped to it. Speaking of Kath, I need to make sure to say yes here, otherwise he'd get angry and the run would be over. He transfers me to the altar immediately, but I need to talk to him first, so I'll homeward run back. Both discovering and joining the Dark Wraith Covenant is necessary, as upon doing so I receive the Dark Hand for Knight's Honor. Then I place the Lord Vessel and proceed to Andre, where I'll modify my spear to plus 11 using the very large ember and also perform the so-called negative dupe of Souls of Sif and Butterfly, as Frumpt is obviously unavailable. When prompt swapping at a merchant, it is possible to select a quantity while purchasing a non-stackable item, in this case the Longsword. Purchasing the weapon in this way inherently pairs it with the selected quantity, although I only obtained the weapon once. Then, when selecting to purchase it again, the game has to determine whether to offer me a quantity selection and if so, what is the maximum quantity I should be able to purchase. It does this by taking the maximum stack of the selected item, which for a weapon is always 1, and subtracts the stack number I possess. Again, for a weapon it should either be 0 or 1. However, as I have PromSwap purchased the longsword, it keeps the inherent quantity of 999. Thus the game performs a calculation of 1 minus 999, resulting in the value of negative 998 being stored in the game's memory. After that, going through the same procedure as when quantity using a consumable, I manipulate the stored quantity into the drop prompt of Soul of Sif and then Soul of Butterfly. Dropping a negative number of an item results in receiving a surplus and therefore duping the item instead. You might think that at this point I would be quite nervous, being this close to the end of the run and with a decent leeway for the sub 2, but trust me I was not, as I had lost close to 10 individual runs within the late game during the lead up to this particular run. When I say lead up, I mean like within the previous 10 streams. Speaking of which, if you're still watching, thanks for enjoying the run so far. I stream speedruns live over on my Twitch, so if you think you'd like to hang out with us and join the discussions as I attempt to go fast in the background, it's switch.tv slash catalystd. There's a link in the description. Instead of heading directly to the blacksmith, I need to drop down this broken window in order to acquire the Dragon Slayer Great Bow, the last permanent item left to pick up. At my big friend over here, I purchase large titanite shards and proceed to upgrade all of the necessary equipment to the max. This wraps up the divine weapon achievement, along with the raw weapon and strongest weapon for plus 15 spear.
Then I immediately revert the spear back to plus 10 so I can ascend it, which is the next step, ascending all the weapons to their boss soul advancements. However, I need to somehow keep the Gwyn soul that we haven't duped, because it also needs to be offered to the Sunlight Covenant. Therefore, I make sure to keep the Gwyn Lord Greatsword Ascension for last, and at the end of the menuing sequence, prompt swap the Ascension pop-up into a different tab, allowing me to obtain the boss weapon while keeping the soul of Gwyn, as material from the targeted item tab is used instead, and at this point, Knight's Honor is almost collected. Except for that elusive Black Knight Halberd with a 45% chance of dropping. I'm sure you almost forgot about it by now, and probably so has Miyazaki. Anyways, after boning back, I now warp to the Sunlight Altar Bonfire to offer Sunlight Medals and also the Gwyn Soul, finishing the Collectathon of all miracles. Once that is done, I use nearby boxes as means of cancelling the spell swapped fireball animation and perform a wrong warp. This one is actually even more difficult and precise than the one executed in Parish earlier. I mess up my position and don't have enough time to rest at the bonfire in time before being warped back to the altar. This is actually not that big of a deal as I can virtually retry immediately, but I chose to go to Parish instead to make it a little bit easier for myself. Now in the kiln, there is just a 45% dream of a Black Knight Halberd dropping between one speedy boy and freedom from the All Achievements speedrun prison. With hundreds of viewers jointly watching in prayer, I will leave you to enjoy the rest of this thriller. Thank you so much for taking your time to watch my speedrun and please consider subscribing if you are interested in further Souls content. Come on game, I know you want it, we want it. This is the fucking destiny. Come on. Alright, cast power within here. Prepare a soul mass for this PKS guy. Prepare a soul mass for the BKGA guy. So he doesn't bother us. Forty-five percent ring is equipped. Really? Come on, dude. I know you want to drop it. It's right there in your right hand, dude. Come on, motherfucker, dude. How many times will I have to go through this shit? Tokens up too, I guess. Very well. Alright, fuck it, going parish again. For the forty five per cent, it has prey. Yo, thank you so much, Frank, for the three months. Welcome back. For the Reset City family, enjoy the new silver badge next to your name. Also, Lucky Liam. Please give me some of your luck. Thank you so much for the sub. Welcome. For the Reset City family, enjoy the soon to be 20 plus 5 animated demos that come along with it. Thank you. Yeah, we can definitely still get this. Come on, dude. 45% twice. It's gotta work out, dude. Please. I don't care about it being the second cycle. I just want it. Hmm, <sighs> come on. Second shot, let's do this. Let's fucking do this. 45% again! 
Come on, Gamba, please work out in our favor. It's right there, dude. Right there in your right hand. Come on. No! Why a shield again? Ah! How many times will I get a shield there? Bro! This game is fucking sh shit! That's like the second time that I've had this happen. Yes, I want to talk. I want to tell you how great this game is, Kath. I'm so sick of this shit, dude. Like, I had this exact same scenario happen before, where sub 2 pace didn't get a halberd. I still could PB on the second go. It wasn't gonna be sub 2, but I could have PB'd. And I got a fucking shield. And this time, the same exact thing. I mean, this could maybe still actually do it. I don't really know about... Nah, nah, this is not gonna work out, it's too much. I don't know why I went to the left there. This could still be it, dude. Holy shit. Jump faster! No! Nothing fucking connected there. Need one more spell. This is it! We did it! We did it! We did it, chat! Fucking three cycles, dude. baby let's go this is ridiculous but it happened ah such terrible last split but it doesn't matter it's over two hours was the goal or under it and we got it mm. lukash ziggy leshko you can suck it dude whatever that guy did Probably didn't script the halberd to not drop, but we did it, dude. We didn't give up at the end. We didn't give up. Dude. Go! I can't believe this. This is freedom. Ah, I can smell it. Uh, that's just the cinnamon from my oatmeal, but I can still smell the freedom. Let's go, guys! We did it! Yo, thank you everyone, holy shit! For the gift subs and stuff, I'm gonna have a lot of catching up to do there. And with that, three months of grinding for the first ever All Achievements run to be completed in under two hours was finished. Shoutouts to everyone who helped me with learning the route for the speedrun, and everyone who cheered me on as the attempts piled up. And once again, thank you so much for checking this run out, I really hope you enjoyed. Until next time, take care and have a great day.